I'm Poppy Behrens, publisher of Minico, and we're delighted to have you in the audience today. If you're joining us for the first time, this is one of several informative webinars planned for self-storage owners, operators, managers, investors, developers, and other industry professionals. The sponsor of today's webinar is Phoenix, Arizona-based Open Tech Alliance. Open Tech is the leading developer of innovative self-storage solutions. The company's products and services include seven models of Insomniac kiosks, Insomniac, Insomniac Live Call Center Services, and Insomniac Self Storage Network for online storage reservations. OpenText products and services improve customer convenience, reduce operating costs, and increase revenues for self storage facilities. Today's speakers are Sue Haviland and Cynthia Abram Hansel. Sue Haviland is the owner of Haviland Storage Services and a partner at Self Storage 101. She has a stellar record of operational experience and performance with 23 years of self-storage leadership. Sue is a former vice president for Extra Space and Price Self Storage and was a district manager for LACO. She has served as the senior facility manual I'm sorry, she has served as the senior faculty member for the Self Storage Association and currently holds a position on the SSA Committee for Education. She previously served three years on the California Self Storage Association Board of Directors. Cynthia is responsible for the Insomniac Live Call Center Business Center Unit of Open Tech Alliance. As a sales and operations professional with over 20 years of experience, she has served as an individual, inv individual and invaluable leader on several high-profile teams for companies including Antimim.com, WriteFax, and Call Maximizer. Cynthia is well-known and a highly respected leader in the self-storage industry and is sought after as a trusted resource for the development of innovative and profitable communication solutions. This year marks the 31st anniversary of Mini Storage Messenger, providing the self-storage industry with in-depth news and information. Each issue of Messenger offers cover stories and feature articles on the most timely industry topics and trends. Monthly columns contributed by industry experts and accomplished business professionals address a wide range of topics, including security, facility operations, technology, legal issues, legislative updates, construction, and development. We also publish a variety of other self-storage data sources, such as those you see listed on your screen. For more information, please visit ministoragemessenger.com. We invite you to submit questions throughout today's webinar. To do so, simply type your question in the question area and click Send. Depending on the question, we will either answer it privately to the entire group. Those that cannot be answered due to time constraints will be answered after the webinar has concluded. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing on demand from our archives. Today's presentation should run about 45 minutes with the remainder of the hour open to questions and answers. And now it's my distinct pleasure to turn the presentation over to Sue and Cynthia. Good morning to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Poppy, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to participate today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Sue Havel Haviland. For those of you that may not know Sue, she'll give you um, a little bit more background about her experience in the self-storage industry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here today, and um, I want to thank Open Tech for inviting me to give the operator perspective. Um, obviously, with my participation today, you can see that I am in favor of using call center services. Um, I believe in them, and part of that comes from, as Poppy said, my 23 years of experience. Um, I started as a site manager, um, have held many different hats in the industry, and due to that, um, and all these many years that I've been around, I've really seen the evolution of how we run our stores and the collection of data and what we can use it for. And so, you know, for me today, I'm just pleased to be able to share some of my experiences and thoughts from the operations end of how this type of service can be useful. Um, and I'm also here to help um, point out, because again, I've also done not used services with many of the stores that I've run, and so can kind of share some of the differences of when you do and when you don't, and again, how over the last few years I've seen so many changes, um, mostly all for the better, and that just make us much more successful operators. Um, as Poppy had said about both Cynthia and I, we both, you know, um, worked with people who have no call center, have had one of their own, have used um, 
other vendors have used OpenTech. Um, it's been the big guys, the list guys. And so there's just a lot of experience here between the two of us with the using this service and not. So I'd like to just let Cynthia have a moment here to just give a little bit more of her background and we'll get started. Sure. And, you know, I, I joined Open Tech Alliance um, back the beginning of 2009 to launch a call center that does deliver the services that owners and operators have communicated to me throughout my career in the self-storage industry that, you know, they've communicated that they need to improve their operations. And, you know, when I talk into Open Tech, they definitely have the technology. I think uh, most of you would agree they are the technology leaders in the industry. I brought to the table the experience. We've been operating Insomniac Live Call Center for, um, for two years now and just have had tremendous success delivering a service where we are truly an assistant manager uh, to the facility's on-site staff. And, um, you know, so, so today it all ties, the, the phone system data all ties into the call center. If you have a call center, it's easy to get that data. And if you, and if you don't, we're going to share with you some, some things that uh, you can do. And that's why Sue's here today, to really from the operational side. I haven't ran the operations and self-storage industry, but I do listen to folks like Sue that uh, have been out there running the operations and my customers running the operations and really looking at what I can do, what we can do as a company to help them with their, with their business. So today, Sue and I will be sharing with you, you know, what phone data you should be collecting, uh, what to look at at least on a monthly basis, and how your data can help you improve your conversion ratios, your staffing, and also identifying some training opportunities. And I want to make sure that everyone understands that the discussion today is not related to tracking numbers for marketing purposes. That's a different topic altogether. It's a topic that we talk a lot about in our industry at all kinds of other webinars and the trade shows in the magazine. Um, but today it's truly taking a look at the phone data that you should be collecting and how you can utilize it to help your operations. And Cynthia and I hope that by the end of the presentation you have a better understanding of how this really can help you make informed business decisions. And we're going to try to keep the presentation short and, you know, really simple so that we have plenty of time to answer your questions at the end. Right. And, you know, what, what you're seeing now is bringing it full circle. You know, the big guys out there, they're bringing it, it, for, it full circle. You hear them talk about the call center services that they have. Um, they're, they're using it. They're using them effectively to compete with you, and they're doing it very well. And it's not just about handling the call. You need to bring that full circle. Uh, you know, some of these bigger companies, they've in, invested pretty heavily in that area, and they do a very good job of the data they collect to understand how they're going to improve their operations and better serve their customer and ultimately rent more units. Uh, Open Tech Alliance, we, have, um, we are successfully building an infrastructure for the small and mid-sized operators to bring that same kind of benefit to you, the smaller and the mid-sized operators. It's not just a function of taking the call. It's collecting the data, analyzing the data, and making improvements based on the data that you've collected and, and analyzed and making some changes. And on the operation end, you know, in the past, we've had some operators that I've either worked for or consulted with that has, have used the call center as a threat. And so for many people in the industry, um, especially if it's something new to them, it's seen as a threat. Um, it's been used to tell them that they're going to be replaced, or they get the fear that they'll be replaced. It's been used to cut staff without understanding the full potential it can offer to increase their business. But, you know, the call center has to be viewed as a partnership. You know, the people who work your properties, whether they are the on-site staff, your supervisors, you know, they need to see it as a tool to aid them for their success and, you know, take advantage of that. Um, when it's trained as a positive tool that aids them, not replaces them or punishes them, you know, it can really be help, 
you know, an immense full help, just especially when you're, say, on a new lease up property, or you're on a struggling store, or you have a stabilized store that just, you know, has just kind of stayed the same forever. You know, a little, you know, burst in with the call center and analyzing the data, you know, can maybe show you some areas that you could improve. I, I've just seen far too many times the effects of um, using the call center but not training the staff, not including them in the process, you know, and just not having any expectations and knowledge of what's supposed to be done now that they have this tool. So, you know, I, I've seen it be so successful and then again I've seen the ones where you put it in because everybody's doing it and then it flounders or it's ineffective as the tool because nobody knows what to do with it. Right. And then, um, you know, and if, if you're using a call center, they're probably collecting a lot of the, the data that we're talking about here today. Um, you, you have your, your phone system data that they will have and, and probably are, are providing, um, you know, for, for you to use. If you're not using a call center to answer all of your calls, you know, maybe there's just on rollover, or you don't have a call center service at all um, there at, that you're using for your facility, then um, if you're not doing so already, you need to come up with a way to collect this data for those calls that your managers are picking up there at the facility. Um, you know, first Sue is going to discuss some different processes and procedures that she's used in operations where she has managed to collect this data on site. So some people think you have a call center and so this data is being collected, but what about those calls that are being answered there at the facility? You also want to make sure that you're, you're collecting the data. Before um, I turn it over to Sue to talk about how to collect this data and, and her to give you some ideas from an operations side, let's first go ahead and take a, a quick poll. And it, it's actually a, a poll with three questions. Uh, the first question is, do you currently have a call center service? It's just a simple yes or no. And then the second question is, do you currently collect the, the phone data that you need? How many calls are, are coming in? Any type of phone data, are, are you collecting it? The type of calls that are coming in, yes or no? And if you are collecting it, have you begun to review the phone data that you're collecting? Pretty simple questions, not too difficult. And, and the first the end, step truly is to get that data collected. And we'll be sharing this, the answers to this little poll before the end of the, the webinar with you. And there's some data that um, you know, if you are doing it manually, there is some important operational data that you will not be able to track manually, such as what are your hold times, what are your abandoned calls, uh, what are the, you know, number of, of hang-ups, somebody that had a hold or got the answering machine and, and chose not to leave a message. Um, you know, so those, that's some of the data that you're just not able to track manually. If you have a call center, they should be tracking this, as well as, you know, how, how many calls are being answered right away with no hold times. Okay, so okay. now that we've had our um, three polls, thanks everybody for filling those out. Um, so again, if you don't have a call center, how are you having your managers collecting this type of data? Or, you know, what is it you're collecting? You know, it's figuring out what's important to you. So those of you without a call center, I mean, you know, I pose out to you and think about your people who work your sites. Who's really answering your phone? How do you know? I mean, you say, oh, silly Sue, you know, um, Bob and Alice work at our property, they answer the phone. But without looking at some kind of data, do you know, does Bob answer all the calls or does Alice answer all the calls? 
Um, again, so in looking at that, and what's an acceptable number of calls to miss per day or week? I mean, if you don't have some kind of service or a backup um, to help, you know, if you have a very busy facility and, you know, we've all, you know, felt the crunch in the last couple years and maybe we've cut some hours or staff, you know, who's covering those phones? And so what's acceptable to miss? You know, you see a lot of people carrying their cell phones and phones out on the property, so they're taking calls while they're in the middle of helping someone else. But, or they have to, you know, I, I tend to a lot of stores, I've seen a lot of managers ignore the phone and let it just, you know, go to the, the voicemail, the answering machine, or the call center. So again, what's the acceptable number of calls per week your staff can miss? And then what do you do to decrease the number of missed calls? And again, how do you know why they were missed to begin with if you're not collecting any kind of data? So, you know, I really wanted to shift the from the process that I've used to collect the data on site and the operations I manage. You know, the first step is to capture the data so you can report on it. You know, so again, without the sophistication of a high-end phone system and data collection application, which is used by some call centers and, you know, the, the big guys that are full circle like Cynthia mentioned, you know, when you're collecting this data, it can be really challenging to have your staff collect it manually. Not only is it challenging to collect it manually, it's really challenging to collect it so that it's really correct. You know, I'm, I'm actually on site at a property today doing an audit, and when I was asking about, you know, how they, you know, collect their data for the phone, they said, well, we don't have any forms, and we do ticky marks at the end of the day. We, you know, gauge it the best we can. So wow, that's some really accurate um, information on why, you know, uh, when the phone rang, why it rang, you know, and again, and so it's just so important if you are going to do it manually to come up with some kind of system and then again, figuring out what's important to you. So I've, I've put together on the next slide, we've got just a little simple sample of a manual form that, you know, just kind of to look at. And, you know, it just, it's to track some of the components that we're discussing today. So you can still do it manually. But again, whatever you customize your form to be, it's only going to be as good as the follow through and use it gets. So again, um, if we could pull up the form and um, take a look at it here, it's got, um, you know, um, samples of, um, you know, the day that it's called, the different criteria, and again, picking what criteria is important to you to answer. So um, also then, it's really important if um, you're doing it manually, if you have a reason why when somebody called, um, why they maybe didn't turn it into a reservation, or um, why they didn't rent after calling or visiting you. So again, when you're manually collecting the data, you're not typically getting the time of the call how long the call was, who took the call, and in many cases, not even the day. Um, so again, you know, to top it off, many people who do make the effort to track the data, then they don't do anything with it that's never used. And I, I'll admit, in, over the many years I've done this, I've done the same thing. We've made managers, we try to track things, we collect it, we're good on it for a little while, and then it kind of gets by the wayside. Again, because it is one of those processes manually that can be a pain. And again, you get into the, did somebody guess on the information they put on this manual tracking form today? How accurate is the data really at all? So again, even those of us that do have the service available to us too, sometimes we don't use it as much as we could too. And you know, it's like with anything, our software, our, you know, our call or like this, we have to utilize every function of it and, and just make it such a tool. So one of the right. biggest things we've home data has helped me over the years is staffing the stores. And knowing the busiest days, you know, that's, that's really helpful. You know, we can't assume if whether we have one or six stores that they're all busy on the same day. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, we're busiest on Saturday, and then you track something and find out you're busiest on a Wednesday. And it's also helped me to make sure we don't overstaff or understaff. Um, having these type of reports has helped me plan not only the day-to-day, -day, but if it's in a, a market where it's seasonal, um, you know, college, you know, renters, things like that. So having the ability to look at past months and help plan for the busier days. 
you know, it's helped me to know who's doing the bulk of the calls. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, is Bob answering all the calls or is Alice? And if you're maybe only on a rollover service, you know, this can really tell you who is not answering your phone. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to give a couple examples of, you know, how I've caught people in these reports, but it's helped me for trading issues, performance issues. It's helped me to see how well we do securing reservations. You know, and I've personally found my reservation numbers to be higher when I utilize a call center. So again, if you're manually tracking, that's fine. Just make sure even focusing on one or two of these things can make your operation better and using that. So, you know, the one one example I wanted to give and then I'm turn it back over to Cynthia is, you know, I had an employee and there were they were one of the superstar team for me and I noticed that their and they were just doing rollover calls, and I know it's all of a sudden their volume was so much higher, and their sister store that was like three miles away, you know, what had a lot less calls. The managers were actually answering. So in checking into that, I found that I had a scenario where the manager basically from 12 to almost 2 o'clock every day was on the phone with her mother. Her mother had fallen ill, and so she was on the phone in the office on the business phone with her from 12 to 2 every day. And so all calls that came in rolled to the call center that day. So again, yeah. having these reports was a great way to help me figure that out. So right. And he, yeah, and knowing, knowing, you know, the calls that you are missing, you know, are just so, so much more important today than they ever have been before. You know, gone are the days where consumers are going to hold in a queue or leave a message because they need storage and they cannot find an available unit. They're simply not going to wait or leave a, leave a message. Storage is available, so if their call is not answered immediately, they're going to just hang up and call the next guy. I was reviewing some uh, reports, some of our call center reports, with a customer that had been with us for about six months. And I always like uh, like to review the reports and, and make sure that they know how other operators use them to help their operations. And one of the things this customer pointed out is she couldn't figure out why they were getting so many more why we were getting so many more calls for their facilities than they ever have in the past. They hadn't changed their marketing. Um, the their, their volume was down across the board. They have about 20 or so facilities. And, you know, she was able to come to the conclusion to where with our operations, when we set it up, we make sure that there is, most of the time, there's somebody available to answer that call right away because they're not going to wait in queue. Uh, it's not about holding on the line to see if you have a 10 by 20 available because they can't find it anywhere else. You know, those those days just aren't aren't there anymore. So, you know, she recognized that, you know, in the past she was actually leaving money on the table because those calls were not being answered right away by a live person without going going into queue. Um so I just I just wanted to point that out because that was a, a pretty interesting um observation of one of our customers that, that does look at the data, that does analyze it, and does review it. One of the things you want to look at, did you change something in your marketing? Is it telling you that your marketing is more successful, or is that manager doing more uh, you know, local type things that maybe you can share with other facilities to, to also do to increase that? Um, but it quickly was, was determined none of that had changed. It was really just having that call answered right away. Um, we do want to share with you a few sample uh, summary reports that Insomniac Live provides to their customers that Sue can, um, that Sue can go, go ahead and talk about from an operations standpoint how she uses that data. And the first report we were going to go over would be a call summary report, and I think we're working on getting that report to appear on the screen here. But until it comes up, we can talk about it a little bit because one of the things that we try to do um, here at Insomniac Live is provide you a summary of data 
to where then you can look at it and get a good idea of how things are operating at the facility and then you can always drill down to more detail if, need, if needed based on that summary data. So a, a call summary report would tell you how many calls were presented, how many did get answered. So, so you know, um, do you need to have more staffing or get a call center to where more of those calls are getting answered uh, if, if they're not? And then also, you know, who's calling after hours and, and getting a voicemail message? And then it breaks it out for your rental opportunities. We all know that that's pretty important. Of the calls that you received, how many of those were new sales opportunities? About 80-85% of calls that do come in are probably not new sales opportunities. You're probably looking at 15-20%. We all wish that number was, was a little bit higher. So you need to make sure that your calls are being answered by people that can not only handle a new sales opportunity, but also take really good care of, that, of your existing tenants. And, um, but from a sales perspective, you want to know how many of those sales calls res resulted in a commitment to reserve a, uh, to reserve a unit or do a rental? How many was, you know, did you get to uh, make an, a, an appointment where they have a specific date and time they're going to come in? So the report breaks it down, and then it will break it down by facility. So you can look and see that facility A received X amount of sales opportunities, and um, and they resulted in, you know, a reservation, so that's good. You can look at, you know, facility A had about the average amount of calls, but I have facility B that had almost double. How come there's double amount of calls? And I think this is what Sue was speaking of earlier. That's where she would then drill down to another report that would show her the time of day those uh, calls are coming in, and we're going to actually show you an example of that as well. And, and what, I was trying um, to say from, what I'm trying to say from the operation standpoint that if you do have more than one facility and, you, and they're you know, in the same market or whether they're not, you can um, easily use these to compare them. You can, like as Cynthia was mentioning, you can look at the number of average calls that are missed at each facility. Um, you can, is there one facility that stands out with more calls than the average? Um, and again, if so, you know, I could look at the call time report and see what time calls are being missed, and that's how I caught the one employee on the phone for two hours a day with her mother. You know, and does one facility have fewer new sales opportunities than another, but their call volume is high? And so again, is that a training issue? Um, you know, is the wrong person answering the phone who can't do a, you know, convert a sale? Um, who's calling and why if they're not new sales opportunities? Cause you know, it's nice to know if you get 10 calls in a day, how many of those were actually a lead and how many were somebody wanting to, you know, get directions, pay a bill. Um, and why are sales opportunities lower at, one, lower at one facility? You know, what's the manager doing different from a marketing perspective? And so, again, it's just, you know, all in this one little summary report, you can get so much information. Right, and the and the call time report breaks it out by by the half hour, um, and then the next report we wanted to talk about was the the lead report, and this Sue, I think you were referencing earlier, um, was to where you look at a, a lead report of the date and time that a a lead, a reservation, or appointment was sent. And did it actually convert to a rental? And then you can discuss that with your manager. If it didn't, how come? Or if it did, you know, what did what did we do right? And how can we do it again? Yeah, this is one of my favorite reports um, that you have in your format. I've seen in other formats, but as an operator, often managing several locations. You know, I have my managers provide me the details on the follow-up they did and why the sales opportunity didn't close, you know, or if they ended up closing it later, you know, so it's a, such a useful report to drill down with a facility if the converted sales report summary tells me that one facility's, you know, conversion ratio is much lower than another's. It also drills down for me to figure out, 
like I keep mentioning, the particular employee issues. And so whether you use a call center or not, you should be tracking every opportunity that happens on site. You know, we're all in the boat where we all need every rental that comes through that door. So, you know, if, you, if you're not trying to figure some of this stuff out, how are you going to know how much you may be missing out on? Right, and and with the leads, we um, we we look at those leads for you know at, at least at least sixty days, uh, if not ninety days, to where you want to look that you know if if it came in, follow it through for ninety days to see if it converted. Some people do do plan ahead, and uh, may come come in and rent. So that's a good good report to have. That could change as. They come in and, and rent and do their follow-up. Okay, the the report that you're seeing on your screen now um, is a converted sales opportunity report, and this is showing you based on the type of of sales calls you received, how many did you receive, and and how many converted to an actual move-in. So this is really tracking it full circle. To, to to the actual um, move in and looking at from a reservation standpoint appointment a lead and then your overall conversion and this is a report many operators including Sue have told me this is where they can they can look at some um, some training opportunities especially if if a facility is using a call center and facility, you know, C is converting at a much higher level than facility A. The same people taking those calls, creating those sales opportunities. What is that manager doing different to get those converted to a move-in? Yeah, I mean, this report again is so great. And again, like I said, when we're all trying to get every rental we can. And, you know, right now everybody, you know, we hire, we want them to be the sales and marketing gurus. So this is the type of report that is such a great tool to use because it's, you know, important to make sure you set those expectations for the converted sales. And so I highly recommend if you're not currently doing that, that these goals are set and you begin to make sure everyone knows what they are. You know, what do you want your closing, you know, ratio to be? And what do you do to make sure you follow up with the staff that it's being done? You know, what do you do when you review that it's better than it should be, it's worse than it should be? You know, but you have to make sure they know the expectations and where they are at. And again, reviewing it regularly. You know, with a lot of the stores I've had, a lot of the stores that I consult with, you know, again, it's just that repetition and, you know, when, it's the, you know, the old saying you always hear, if it's measured, it gets done. You know, if you introduce something and then you never go over it again, people don't think that's part of the expectation of what they need to be doing. And our, you know, converting sales and our closing ratios is one of the most important things our managers can, you know, do well at or need to do well at. And so the one important thing I want to communicate to everyone, you know, from my standpoint is you can make an immediate impact on your converted, converted sales percentages you know, if you're doing this stuff, and then when you're doing the follow-up with it, you have a confirmation email. You know, what's exciting for me is Insomniac Live call center that we use, they just added this additional service for the customer. So you get a nice customized confirmation email for all your sales calls, as well as your existing customers that make a payment or call for their balance. The confirmation, you know, includes the logo, coupon, and, you know, if it's applicable office hours, access hours, directions you know, the phone, the email, but I can't tell you how many times in the past I've had managers make a great effort or I, again, audited stores where I'm shopping it and then I get an unprofessional response, you know, with poor grammar, hardly any information, it, it's just horrible. So, you know, this aspect that they've just added, for me, it's, it's, a, it's just a, another one of those, it's like comfort food because I know that everything that goes out to my customers is consistent, it's correct, it's professionally done, it's the information I want them to get, and so it's just wonderful. 
Yeah, we're excited and about the confirmation emails. Um, they, they do work very well for a lot of our customers, and it's something that is approved by corporate and, and like Sue mentioned, customized to where you, you really do have control of that message you're sending out to that, that new potential tenant and also your existing customers. So again, if you're if you're manually doing this yourself, I, I suggest that you you know you have someone make up one, whether you have one store or eight stores, you make up a consistent template that has your logo, a coupon in it if you want, have two, one that has a coupon, one that doesn't, so it's applicable to who you're sending it to, your office hours, the access hours, directions, the office phone mail, the email, and then a link right back to your website if you have it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to just touch base real quick. A lot of times people like to know what, what they should expect as far as converted sales opportunities. I, I get that question asked all the time. And what I'm finding uh, from our customers when you're doing confirmation emails, when your managers are doing the follow-up, that, you know, if, if if a reservation is made, a real-time reservation taken out of inventory, a deposit is made on that account that's applied to the first month's rent, you should be looking at conversion rates at about 90% plus. If they don't have a credit card, for whatever reason they don't make that reservation, and your manager sets up a date and time for them to come in and you know look at the unit, come and do the transaction, what I'm seeing is about 40% conversion rate. When there's a set date and time, that caller feels committed to where if they're not going to make that set date and time, they're going to give you a call and let you know. And then, of what course, there's of those. Oh, and oh, I was just going to say, there's a lot of operators that I know that don't have a call center, they're setting that conversion rate goal at 50%. Okay, great. For the set date and time? Yeah, they, you know, it's okay. kind of been the standard that they need to close a minimum of 50% of, you know, their inquiries and um, appointments that they set. And again, where that... Oh, right, because they're not doing reservations, Sue? Correct. And again, sometimes where that fails, and you don't get as, you certainly don't get the 50, and you'd be happy to have the 40, is because there really truly isn't the follow-up. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So those are just some, some numbers that we do see out, out there. That's a question that's asked a lot is what, what your expectations should be. If you have more than one facility, uh, then it's a little bit easier for you with, with your operations. But that's also something that Sue and I both can uh, help owners and operators better understand based on where where they're at, their operations, their facility as well. Cynthia, Sue, I was wondering, do you guys want to uh, share the polls real quick, the results of the polls? That would be awesome. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and share the first one. Okay, so 32% have a call center, 68% no. And that's great. 63% um, of folks do collect phone data. And um, we have a pretty good percentage that is reviewing that phone data. I think now with the change in the economy and stuff, uh, data is being reviewed more and more, which is which is a good thing. And and I think for those of you that answered the poll that do not have a call center, um, but are tracking it. I mean, being the storage geek that I am, um, our emails on this presentation. I would love to hear you know what you track and how you track it and you know how you um, you know train your staff to be effective with getting you know that good you know, usable information. So any of you that would like to share that, um, our email will be at the end. I would love love to chat with you about that. So, um, you know, here in, in summary, you know, 
we say it's simple. And again, an ineffective communication systems can be very expensive. As operators, we all know, we've probably all done things that we, you know, start and try and we never use it effectively and it ends up costing us money instead of making us money. Um, and again, you know, it's just phone data has proven to be very valuable to our operation. And if you don't know what you have, you're failing to optimize the data at your fingertips to increase occupancy and revenue. I mean, it, it, it helps us identify if we're leaving money on the table. And, you know, we didn't even talk about the marketing aspect of it today. So, you know, both those two together, you know, if you, if you aren't looking at it, you know, don't leave that money out there. And if you have the wrong staff, you know, or if you have a training problem, so, you know, it's just the old, why wouldn't you want to have this type of roadmap at your fingertips? I mean, don't fall into the old cliche, you know, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Right. And we're going to just show you a, a real quick uh, Insomniac Live commercial, you know, and, and how we're a different type of call center. Uh, we truly have created a call center to where we can be an assistant to your on-site staff. Um, calls are being answered immediately, less than 10 second wait times. It's just the way that, you know, if I was going to do another call center, we just, we just had to do it. They're just not going to wait on the phone anymore. And we do back our services with 100% satisfaction guarantee. We have complete transparency. Every call is recorded and you have a chance to review that. Uh, as well immediately once that call has been uh, handled by our storage counselors. And the data analysis I think is very important. It's something I'm very passionate about. And uh, once I set somebody up in our, get in our operations here at the call center after a full 30 to 60 days of data, I want to set up that meeting to review those reports and take a look at them and um, share with you any information that I have and how that information can can be used to improve your operations. So I think we um, do have a few questions to answer some questions that may have come in. No, and absolutely. like Poppy said, we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. No, nope, absolutely. I've got a few questions here. Um, let's start off with this. Uh, I'm new. I'm new to this. What should I start doing? With, start doing first. You want to take that, Sue? Okay. Let's say if you're new to it, um, it doesn't look like you know. If you're new to the call center, I'd say really um, for the aspect that you are new to a call center, really aspect like Cynthia said, your account manager. Um, take any training they give you, um, any tips they can give you, and then again just putting that together, that program of, you know, whether you're on rollover or full, you know, having them answer all of your calls, making sure that you get them all the information they need to, um, you know, make sure that they're representing your site just exactly how you would, and they do a great job of that. And then again, just picking out, you know, if it seems a little, um, you know, daunting at first to like, oh, there's all these reports you know what, what are your needs? So which ones would you, what's most important to you first? Are you wanting to see if you do have a staffing issue? You're looking, you want to try to figure out how to staff the property better? Then, you know, start with, you know, the, even if you just start with the call summary and then add the other report. And again, just, you know, maybe try, if it, again, if it's so new, try just with the rollover calls first, see how that works. Or, or vice versa. You can start with one and see, you know, what what needs it's meeting. And again, if you're if you haven't started with one yet, and if you have a couple sites, start at one site and get it down and, and see the difference. I, I mean, it's always a beautiful thing to see, you know, one site that's you know has the use of it, and you're looking at the data, and then one that's not, and you can compare and see the differences and see how maybe the reservation rate goes up, the conversion rates go up. Um, so again, you know, I just, you know, figuring out what's important to you and in being realistic, you know, don't just do something to do it. Do it because you're really going to follow through on it and use it and make it part of a tool. Okay, excellent. Sue, this one's for you. Um, we have this, uh, they've, um, 
I tried using a call service and have struggled with getting staff on board. Um, what do you suggest to get your staff on board? Bribing them. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, well, uh, for me okay, I'll let Sue answer it. Yeah, for, for me personally, <laughs> a lot of times what I've found, there's some staff you're never going to get on board. And, and part of that is, you know, as operators, we all feel that we are going to answer our phones better than anybody else could, and, and that's the way it should be. But again, we're also, we have a lot to do at our properties, and especially depending on how many people you have working there, you know, selling it as the tool. I'm not sure how it may have been introduced to begin with. Um, a lot of times when I've seen it not, or fail with the managers not embracing it, because it was just, here we have a call center, there was no education with it, um, it was maybe used as a tactic, they, they're fear they're going to be replaced, they fear you don't think they're doing a good job because you don't want them to answer the phone. So, you know, for me it's always been about going in with it, um, you know, again, having the training, myself doing training, having my call center agent do some training, and, you know, asking them what their real concerns are and trying to get to the bottom of that. Um, mm. And then, again, I've just had a few sometimes that just they buck everything and, you know, nothing's going to work. And they feel like they're losing control. And so it's just figuring out what, what's that button with each individual that you have to push to make them buy into it. Um, you know, it's right. no different when we put any kind of new procedure in place. You know, change can be fearful, really fearful for some people. And, you know, over the last few years, the call center type services have gotten so much better at being presented in a positive light, but let's be honest, when they first came out, you know, there was just a lot of negativity that they were there to replace people, and so again, when, you know, managers talk and that, you know, it, it's seen as a tool that replaces them, they're not doing their job, so again, finding, really sitting down with that person, finding out why they can't embrace it, why they think it doesn't work. And then seeing to making sure there's not some issue with why it isn't working, you know, with the call center. Did they have a bad experience with how a couple of their calls were answered? And what do you got to do to fix that? So, you know, if, if they've got a bad taste in their mouth that they think their customers weren't maybe helped as well as they could have been, you know, addressing that as well. Right. And, you know, that is a question that I have heard over the last 10 years being in the industry in the call center that has been a challenge for operators. And, and we know if your manager is not on with, a, with if they are not um, for a program that you're trying to, to implement, your manager on site can make it or break it no matter how great of a program that it is. That is definitely a, something that I took into consideration with developing Insomniac Live. Uh, I will not bring anybody on board into our call center operations until they have gone through a call center orientation. And that is uh, generally done with me, and that is for your managers to get them involved, to show them the people answering their calls um, what they see on their screen and providing them, getting them to a comfort level that we're there to help them and that we're their assistant, they're the manager there and, and we are just an, an, an extension to them and working for them and also have come up with a lot of ways for the managers to, to communicate, let us know what they like and what they don't like. We have the managers rate our calls. Uh, the manager ratings are the most important. Um, so we we look at that. They like it, and I can I'm I'm happy to announce they have embraced it because of the way we we go about it when we bring somebody on board with our call center. We have the manager very much involved in the process. And I think both Cynthia and I, for the few of you out there that might be struggling with this, your manager's not on board. We'd be happy if you contacted either one of us to kind of look at your each situation and see why they're not, and um, you know, look at it from the, the personalized thing of why that person's not embracing it, or why that whole set of staff is not embracing it, and get more in depth with you about how to fix it. We have a whole bunch of questions coming in here, guys. So um, here's one that a pretty interesting one. Now, can you set up a call center to number one? Uh, pick up after a certain number of rings in case your manager couldn't. 
uh, get to it. And number two, pick up only after hours. And number three, uh, pick up on an emergency basis, i.e. your manager is, is sick that day and can't make it in. Yes, to all of them. Okay. All right. Like uh, yeah, yes, you can just do after hours. Yes, you could um, set it up for certain occasions. And um, yes, you, you can pick how many rings. I, I do believe, isn't that correct, Cynthia? You can set it for the range of rings. Right. Um, well, let's move on to the next question, Sue. Um, let's go ahead. Um, we have this one question. I currently have an in-house call center that allows managers the first chance to get the phone call, uh, essentially a rollover process. Would you suggest having all the calls come into the call center first and then dispersed out to the sites? You know, that's kind of, um, I've had scenarios with that as well. And, you know, what I've found that works for me um, over the years is, um, site by site. So depending on how many sites you have, but I have some sites where, you, you know, I have great no but computer. Zero time. Oh, I'm sorry. I have some sites where it would be better to have the call center answer them all for them. Um, you know, just like how busy it is. And then I have sites that, um, you know, you want them to answer it first. So, for me, I would look at that on a site by site. And again, you know, do the, the test and trial. You know, try it with them answering all of them and then going to them or, you know, vice versa. So I know that doesn't really give you an exact answer, yes, do it this way. But I've, I've found both ways to work. And again, depending on the site, the staff that you have at it. Okay. All right. Let me get down another question here real quick. And um, now, this is a pretty interesting one here, too. I have no training department like the big guys. How do I ensure my staff understands a call center's, uh, the call center's uses? Sure. And that is part of the thing. Uh, part of our services at Insomniac Live is making sure that you're, the manager understands the call center operations, what they're what we're there to to help with, and we will help with that training. We we provide them resources, a manager's guide about how the how the call center operates, um, and provide you information to make that part of your operational manual too, with what you want them to do when they do do receive a lead from the from the call center or a reservation, then what's their next step? We're going to help put that all, all together. Okay, excellent. All right. Now, Cynthia, and um, do either of you have any more to, to add to the presentation today? Is there any best practices that you would like to add uh, to the overall presentation as far as collecting data? Well, like I mentioned about just, you know, the best practices that I always found is, you know, being consistent and doing the, the follow-through and embracing it fully. Right. And, you know, this presentation really just touched the surface of data that's that's available out there to, to collect. Um, you know, especially from a call center operation. A lot of the reports and, and information that we were reviewing today is summary data to where there's a, there's a lot more detail that you can always drill down as well. Excellent. I think that's all the, the time we have questions for today. Um, I do want to thank both of you today uh, for joining us and uh, providing us with this excellent presentation. Um, we are going to uh, any questions that we were not able to answer today, uh, we are going to have, um, we are going to be able to get back to you individually, and of course you will have follow-up emails sent off to everyone. And once again, Sue and, and Cynthia, I do want to, uh, I do want to get, once again thank you for both being here today, and uh, we truly enjoyed the presentation. So thank you very All much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.